we met at downtown. We were at a vet, a ventrepreneur, a vet circle kind of meetup. I forget the exact name of it. Do you remember? Veterans, veterans in tech at Capital Factory. Exactly what it that's, was. That's exactly. That's why I'm wearing this this specific shade of green. This is the same shade I was wearing that day. That uh, shut up. For that real? representative. Remember that guy called him called it out, and he was like, "Oh, I see an eagles some eagles green down here. I didn't expect to see that." That guy I Patrick Murphy. That. Oh yeah, I, man. I, I forgot about that. My goodness, that's a. Well, I, I'm very intentional. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, very, very so much. I went down there because I really want to see if I can connect with some other veterans that were very entrepreneurial, that are mission and still very purpose driven. And I'm glad we got to talking because I think we connected on that front. That was kind of my, my intent as well. Um, in addition to just there to network period, um, I was also interested in what was happening with veterans in tech, specifically what Capital Factory may be doing and what kind of programs and offerings that were available. Because like we've talked about, I've got some veterans that are in my clientele and I want to stay on top. And a lot of them are also, you know, the transition from military into tech is a very appealing one to them. And so I wanted to be kept abreast of what options were available and, and what avenues there were for them to kind of make that leap. Mm, mm. So let's rewind, rewind the clock back a bit. Take me back to when you first enlisted in the army. And I think you were a straight out of high school candidate like myself, right? Yes, sir. T take me there and your reason for even joining up to begin with. Yeah, I'll be honest. It was not part of the equation. Um, I had been to LSU. I'd been accepted to LSU. I'd had my classes scheduled. I went to orientation all that stuff the summer after graduating. And uh, I was not ready to kind of make that commitment, I'll say. I was, uh, uh, can I curse on this or no? It's gonna be on YouTube. I don't see why not. I'll keep it PG. I was kind of an F up. Um, and so I kind of, after that summer after high school, it was like, you know what, when it was kind of make that decision, am I gonna do this or not? It was like, you know what, I don't think I'm ready for this. I need to go do something else. Um, because I'm not, I'm not going to be able to keep this commitment and I'm not, I'm probably going to go out there and flunk out with, with the way I was. So, um, I'd had a buddy, two buddies, one that had joined the air force and one that had joined the Marines and they'd gone to boot camps during that summer. And we'd gotten to see them when they come back. And I always respected those two for those decisions. And those were ones that they made because they wanted to, not because they had their hand forced. And so, um, and thinking about what my next step was going to be outside of going to LSU, it was, uh, let's go look at the military as an option. I actually tried to go to the Air Force first, but they wouldn't accept me because I was on uh, ADHD medication at the time, and that was a big no-no for them. And so the Army opened their doors uh, and had accepted me with arms wide open. And I uh, took the ASVAB and um, took my role, which was 96 Bravo, now 35 Fox, intelligence analyst, and uh, went to beautiful Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for basic training from October to December of 04. And then uh, straight from there, uh, went to Sierra Vista, Huachuca, Arizona, at Fort Huachuca for intelligence training for a couple months. Graduated and left there in June of 05. And by November, I was in Baghdad, Iraq with uh, porting a cavalry unit and their mission to secure a lot of the neighborhoods in and around Baghdad, as well as training um, Iraqi army and Iraqi police. Whoa. Okay. So real quick. <laughs> for, for, first of all, you must have tested really well on the ASVAB to be in the intelligence community, correct? I mean, uh, I think I, I've tested right in the right avenues. And I think there was also a big push at that time to to our numbers or up the military numbers for intelligence analysts. Um, I actually don't even remember what the other options were. I remember the um, not the recruiter, but the, the, you know, the main person at the ASVAB office when you're going through kind of your stack and your scores and stuff. And he made it, he was like, oh, what's an intelligence analyst? He's like, oh, it's like the James Bond of the army. Like, yeah, man, sign me up. That'll, that's awesome. Of course. Uh, it was not really like that, of course, at all. But um, it was able to convince an 18 year old kid that it would be. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's So you checked into your, your, at the fleet for maybe a day and then got almost immediately deployed. 
Yeah, that right? pretty much. Yeah, checked in okay. in like late June. There was a couple months, but most of that was just like spent in the field, ramping up and getting ready to deploy, right, for weeks at a time. And then packing your stuff and, and get on the rail yard and then shipping it out. And then you're just kind of waiting. And then uh, I want to say maybe right after Thanksgiving of 04 is when we deployed, like early December, late November. So like real quick, I barely had time to get to know folks. And it's it's funnier too, because the unit that I originally actually saw, got to uh, when I first arrived at Fort Hood, I didn't deploy with them. I switched to that cab unit maybe a month or two before we deployed just because they needed another intelligence analyst body. Their their job was so underhanded, they needed someone. So I went from um, the support battalion into the cab squadron to help out. I, I didn't remember that until just now, actually. Wow. Isn't that funny how yeah. when you reminisce, what comes kind of back? It, well, most of that training, that different deployment was with my previous unit. So then by the time I got to the cab squadron, it was just like time to pack up and basically go. I was kind of learning my you know, meeting and, and learning about my NCOs and, and uh, fellow Joes kind of like on the, on the fly, on the, on the plane over there. Wow. So for me, 05 was when I joined. And when I got to my unit at Camp Pendleton, we were slated to deploy within six months of me checking in. But mm -hmm. I was one of the lucky few. Well, I was the only one from my unit that got shipped to 29 Palms to hand to help out the because they had Mojave Viper there and that was the, the training program for all the Marines and uh, getting ready to go to Iraq and it was a brand well a fairly newer program as far as like because it was shifting tactics and all that stuff so I sure. went there for several months missed my first opportunity to deploy because I stayed out there in 29 Palms and then didn't get to go until like a year later but mm. at that point, I was already in the fleet in my job for, I think, two years. So okay. not right after basic and, you know, all your training. So almost very different in that respect. So, yeah. wow, 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 wow. Okay, so you did how many years as in the Army? Eight years in the Army. I spent two in Iraq and another deployment, my third one in Afghanistan for three years deployed. Okay, so eight years okay. active service. And that stretch of time for two years, that was back to back was it no no god that was one of those things that was happening people were getting a lot of guys were getting stop loss and a lot of guys were getting their deployments extended like i heard horror stories about people who you know they're literally on the plane on the tarmac getting ready to take off to go home and orders come down up oh, you got to stay for another six months and you got to hold down the fort like man but we got really lucky that that happened to us there was a lot of talk about that potentially happening and whether it was turning our 12 month into a 15 or even an 18 month, but luckily it didn't happen. We got back in December of 06. Yeah, December of 06. And then I had about another 18 months until my next deployment. But by that, I mean, by that time things had changed so much, right? Fort Hood used to be, I think it's Fort Cavazos now, but Fort Hood used to be mainly first, uh, first Cav Division and Fourth ID. Those were the, the two main units and main presence there. But then 4th ID, I don't know if you remember this or know about, they went to, they relocated to Fort Carson, Colorado, and it became just a first, the first CAV base for the most part. Um, and when that happened, they kind of gave us the option. Do you guys want to come up to Colorado and stay with the division or do you want to reflag and, and fall under first CAV? And me being a Texas guy with my family in Houston and all my friends kind of in the surrounding area and colleges, it was kind of a no brainer to just stay at Fort Hood and, and reflag to first CAV. So we deployed with them from June of 08 to June of 09. And by that time I was at the at the brigade level. So I was getting to do a lot, a lot more different things, cooler things. I was managing some ISR assets for our night shift. So if we had troops that got into contact, I was able to flex UAVs and F-16s to provide support to them, give a kind of a watchful eye, some some lethality and some protection they needed. So I got to I got to out of the three different deployments, I got to have such like three different experiences. None no no deployment was exactly other one they were all very different missions and very different levels so i got a real diverse experience set from from those wow that's that's badass that's badass it, probably it is. on a personal level like in person level i'd definitely love to hear more about that in greater detail okay so after eight years then you decide to get out and tell me about that kind of transitionary kind of phase in your life I mean, to be honest, I will put my exit from the military up there with with anybody's as one of the 
one of the one of the best i think i um for that third deployment it was a it was a volunteer mission and i had already kind of before that had come up i had kind of just resigned to the fact that like okay six and a half years i feel like i've i've kind of done I've, you know I've, my career's kind of run its course essentially there's not much more i want to do i think it might be time to to join the civilian world then that afghanistan mission came up which was an interrogation mission small team it was like super cool opportunity i hadn't been to afghanistan so i was like i want to go to that um, but i didn't have enough time on my contract so instead of re-enlisting i just extended my contract and as a result of that they i was afforded the college option and so when i got back from that deployment in afghanistan of january 2012 after block leave for 30 days and getting to relax and reset i just kind of became a full-time college student basically while i was still enlisted and so i just have to report to a formation like one or two times a week, you know, keep, keep my phone on me in case something was needed. But from, you know, eight to four each day, I was basically a college student taking online classes. So it was, I, I did that for six months, um, knocked out a bunch of credits, got really close to finishing my degree. And then it was time to, to drop my terminal leave packet. Like my last eight months in the military, I hardly did anything military related other than uh, like a PT test here, maybe an NCOER here. I was full-time college student. Um, and then I transitioned out. And once I transitioned out, that was what kind of gave me trouble. I went to DC. I got a job in government contracting right away, kind of doing what I was already doing as an Intel analyst, but on the civilian side. But I left my community. I like didn't have anybody that I knew in DC. I didn't have much of a network. And I was also working night shifts, which are really terrible for your mental health. There's a lot of studies that kind of come out to support that and how bad it is for you. Uh, man, I was struggling. I was I, I didn't know it at the time, but looking back now, man, I was I was in a rough place because all of the things I, I kind of looked at it like, okay, well, that chapter of my life is now closed and now it's like the next chapter. But our minds and our brains and trauma and our nervous systems, they don't really they don't really act according to that, right? They, there's something you can keep after on and move on. And so there was a lot of things that I hadn't dealt with from those deployments and from my experience that were still affecting me in like really, really terrible ways showing up in just depression and trauma and you know, the drinking, binge drinking, a lot, a lot of terrible, a lot of just in a really, really rough place for um, a long time because of it. And it was ironic because professionally, like I just kind of kept going up, like things were great. I, I kept getting... Uh, higher, you know, managerial positions and making more money and doing all this shit and everything looks so great. But man, inside I was fucking, I was struggling. I was really struggling. Wow. Yeah, I can. And so how, how many years were you? From 2012 until, uh, yeah, we moved to Austin in 2019. You said 2012 to 2019? Yep. Seven years. Wow. And you weren't married at the time? No, my wife and I got married in 2018, but we met in 2015 and that was like, I would say that was part of the the recovery process was kind of her and and being part of something bigger than myself. I'd been in a relationship when we moved to to DC originally, but it was not a great one. I wasn't in a great place. I don't think she was either, and it just was very toxic. And so I took about a year in between and really tried to work on myself and and figure a lot of stuff out. And that's where therapy and things like that came in. But I think meeting my wife is really the catalyst for kind of changing my whole my whole life. Yeah. Yeah, I know I went through not just after when I transitioned out in that kind of window of time, but kind of just for the next several years uh, and not even being beknownst to it in myself, right? Because almost on a subconscious level, just your the addictions you get or go through to kind of cope with what you're feeling and what you're going through at the time, especially mm -hmm. when you're trying to still figure it out and trying to f regain some purpose in your life. And what that looks like after leaving, you know, leaving the military. Yeah, because I mean, it's just you're kind of you have a purpose by default when you have the uniform on, right? And it's easy, and you know where your target is and the mission and everything. And you take that uniform off, and it's just like where one thing that I, you know, the military has so many, so many great things and so many great things for for people. But one thing I think they fail at is setting us up for that transition into into civilian life when it's time for us to do that. I know that they have the proper transition programs. And I can only speak to the armies here, so I hope I don't offend any other services. But, you know, there's, there's, they, they set you up with, you know, how to do a resume and, and how to network and all this other stuff, but they don't, you know, there isn't, wasn't really, at least back then, 
program that kind of teaches you how to refine yourself, right? There's a, how to reintroduce yourself into into society and, and start to live according to your own values and not, you know, the the eight or so values that the army has kind of um, put upon you for the last however many years. You got it's a journey about finding yourself, right? The the thing about the military is that it's never about the self. It's all about the team. It's about the squad, right? It's not about the individual. When you step in and, and kind of cross that line and leave military life behind, it it's all about the individual. It's all about you. And so that's that can be a jarring kind of change um, and contrast for folks. So I think we need to do better. I think the military needs to do a better job of, of preparing us to make that transition. Yeah, I'm. I, I feel pretty confident in saying that I'm fairly certain that all the services or transitionary kind of programs or whatnot suck. And they definitely <laughs> could just not just use a tune up, but have it's almost like when I went to college, right? You're learning a lot of things, but it's not directly transferable to what's happening in real time in the real world. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't, it can't, it doesn't keep up with that. And, uh, anyways, so you came back to Texas, I think you said around 2019. And then, so take us from there. When you came back here, did you come back here to just move closer to family or was it a work thing? Kind of a combination of factors. I mean, the cost of living in DC is outrageous. Um, and there was not really an opportunity for us to kind of have the home that we wanted to have. You know, we've got dogs and we want some space. We want to start a family. And it's just like not, it's not feasible or were to, for that to happen unless you're going to like a townhouse that's 20 to 30 years old already. It's just, it's just not built for that. Or you like move way, way out in the suburbs and then you got a horrendous commute. And we were just over that life. Um, and we had gotten married in Austin in November of 2018 and uh, loved, loved the place, loved the space, loved the area, loved the vibe, loved everything about it. And all kind of told ourselves, like, once we got back, like, hey, we need to, it's time to start moves to, to find a house down there. Um, it was tough, man. It was really tough. By the time we find something that we liked online and book tickets to go check it out and, and all that, it was already the market. And so we actually bought our place without having stepped foot in it. Our realtor just walked through on, on FaceTime with us. And we saw pictures and everything, and we were like, okay, this is this will work. But it also worked thing because my wife was able to transfer um, her her company. She worked out at Corner, Virginia. They have a home office here in Austin as well that she was able to just transition straight to. And then for me, my company created a, a remote role for me in business and development and some merger and capture stuff. So we were able to luckily kind of have jobs when we kind of landed and set foot here, which was which was really helpful. And they rolled from summer 2019 straight into a couple months later into COVID. And so we kind of didn't have a chance to make friends or network or really, really experience the city um, and what it has to offer before the kind of world shut down for a little bit. Wow. Okay. So I didn't know that. That's a new piece of information. So you got to Austin right when the pandemic hit and then Just about. sheltered in place for a while. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of, uh, I guess, bring it back to more recent times. So ultimately after the pandemic, I, I, I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm asking is like, what ultimately got you to being a performance coach, getting into what you're doing now. Sure. And let's talk about that. Yeah. So I like to say that I've kind of been coaching like my whole life almost, um, especially in the military. One of my favorite things about it was mentoring, developing and counseling soldiers and watching someone go from, you know, E1 to E5 and, and kind of watching that pride as they get pinned. Um, so I'd always been doing that. And then again, my favorite part of, you know, government contracting, God bless it. It's not the spreadsheets. It's not, it's not the, you know, and all the documents and the admin piece. It was the people and it was helping people go from point A to point B in their career and just kind of uplifting everybody. And so it was a natural fit for me, but my first experience with it, my wife was actually um, getting sales coaching through her company. And we would have conversations about it. And uh, she was so like intrigued by it. And I would love, it was one of, started to become one of the parts of the week was hearing her download kind of from, from what she experienced. And eventually it's like, you know what? Like, do you think that guy would talk to me? Like, do you think you could, you could set that up? Talking to, to that coach for about 30 minutes. I, he was like, yeah, dude, this is, this is a hundred percent what you'd be doing. Like this is, this is a thousand percent you. And so immediately signed up for my first couple of courses for certification and, 
started working on my certification right away. And within a year, I had my ACC, my associate coaching credential from, from ICF, which is kind of global governing coaching body, and uh, my CPCC certified professional coactive coach from the Coactive Training Institute. And so uh, once I had those two things under my belt, and there's a lot that comes with those, right? It's a six month certification in addition to five classes before that, you know, 100 hours of training clients, you have to pass several exams. It's, it's a whole thing. But then when I started that down that path, uh, then it was time to start finding community. And so I reached out to my, at the advice of that original mentor to find ICF Austin, right? ICF, which I just mentioned, the global coaching body. They've got chapters all over the world, including right here in Austin. And I had to fight through a little imposter syndrome because like becoming a coach was still kind of new for me. So I wasn't even sure if I was worthy enough to even be in this organization or if they'd even take me. But I met with their membership director and had an amazing conversation with her. And she just like kind of set the space so beautifully for me to join the chapter. And they welcomed me with open arms, which if you're familiar with coaches, like, duh, of course, because they're all amazing people. Um, and yeah, I started working on the community outreach committee, trying to partner with local nonprofits and other businesses to uh, kind of share some pro bono coaching office offers on behalf of our chapter, which um, then became taking on the role on the board as the membership director, which was uh, awesome. I was, uh, it was one of my favorite of service. I got to meet so many cool coaches, hear so many great stories. Um, we launched a podcast for the chapter to help share those stories and kind of um, share the beauty of coaching with, you know, the region and, and others. And then um, after a year of that, I uh, somehow got convinced to take on the president role, uh, president of the board, president of the chapter. So um, coming up on just about six months now, if I have actually seven months now, having haven't done that role. Uh, and it's been extremely fulfilling, very tough, very stressful, but very fulfilling. It's been awesome to watch both the individual board members and individual members of the chapter as they go and do great things like, you know, releasing books and releasing courses and launching podcasts and launching programs and doing all these great things. And then also what the chapter is doing. We're at our highest chapter number, chapter member number in our year history, which is awesome. We've got more in-person events and offerings than we've ever had before. And so we're just really excited about, you know, what we've been doing, but even more excited about what we've got going on in 2024 and beyond. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. Your uh, business performance coaching, mm -hmm. can, do you have like a certain demo, like demographic, but a certain client avatar that you like to focus on? Is it any kind of thing with the veteran community or how can you, kind of paint that picture for me? Yeah, sure. It's funny. I've um, I transitioned in the last year from only taking one-on-one -on -one clients to now bringing more organizations into, into the fold, which has been fantastic. Um, and I don't do anything that's necessarily veteran focused or outreach to veterans specifically, but I always keep pro bono spots available in my portfolio for clients for veterans who are either small business owners or making the transition from you know, military to civilian life, I always keep something open. And it's funny, those, they, we just, they find me, find me somehow, kind of like how we connected. But then there's been so many other examples of, of veterans, whether it's in my community, just walking around or online and LinkedIn, where we just, we just mesh. And so it's not necessarily focused on anything like that, They're, that they do make a part of my clientele. But as far as common threads between who, who I'm working with, right now, a lot of people who are ready for expansion and organizations that are ready for expansion. You know, the, those businesses that have been maybe operational three or four years and have been kind of winging it and are now to a stable place and ready to kind of level up and expand to what's next. Those are kind of the situations where I'm finding myself right now drawn to and, and kind of attracted to and called to. So uh, for example, I work with, I work with a production studio right now five man team. They just recently bumped up to five and they are kind of ready for what's next. They've been operating at a certain level for so long and they're now ready to kind of expand into their, into the next level and what they've got going on. And so a lot of that has been some leadership training and leadership development and preparing those guys to understand like they were, you know, one role behind the camera and a director chair, or producer chair, but now they've got another title to add where they're leading, they're leading this charge, they're leading this team, they're managing this team. So they have to 
think, act, move, communicate a little bit differently than how they have before. And so we go over a lot of strategies for how they want to do that and also um, how they want to do that authentically. And so that it's, it stays true to who they are and their values and what matters to them, as well as the values of the company. Mm. So it, you, you, you approach this uh, at an individual level and at an organizational level? Yeah, yeah. It's more it's more trending towards organizations only. And I, I transition my one on one into more of a, a kind of high ticket offer. But yeah, that's where we're at right now. OK. And when I say organization, you can think of like a small or medium business that's looking to, I guess, scale up as far as manpower, because it seems like it's a very people oriented kind of uh, almost like strategy to help with the growth. Is that correct? That's part of it. And it's also there's that's just to kind of support that accountability piece and also being a thought partner and, and you know, helping flesh out and really get to the root and, and not just not just the idea, but the why behind the idea is, is so much more important than realize when you can connect to the why of everything and you can clearly communicate, communicate that, especially to your team. And it'll take you really far. it will take you really far. Mm -hmm. Man, that's actually a pretty a pretty cool gig you got there. And to be you know, heading in. It's, um, I was just talking to a coach earlier today from Dallas and we just kept talking about how much of a blessing it is. It's such a blessing to be able to do this stuff and, and kind of go where our passions lead us. Right. Like I'm a, I'm a huge film buff film nerd. And so to like, to be able to work with a, a film, a group of filmmakers kind of, you know, they're, they're working on their passions while I'm working on mine with them to support that. Like, it's just, it's, it's, it's freaking awesome. It's awesome, man. I'm so, I'm so blessed and fulfilled right now and just excited for all the opportunity that's out there right now. So as far as your reach, you're, we're, we're both located here in Austin. I imagine with what you do, you could probably have like a wider reach than just being, if you're super local, even great, but if not, you can still help outside of Texas. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Two of my, um, Two of my now are actually outside of Texas that I'll be that I'm going to try to two clients of mine. One is a uh, kind of a digital sports network in Colorado, and the other is a uh, restaurant based in Arizona. But I'm big fans of both of them, and very much looking forward to having a conversation with them about how coaching can help help their businesses. But yeah, it's something it's something it's something that's that's definitely. Um, feasible for you know it doesn't have to be local i do i love one-on-one -on -one and i love being in person with people at such a much more rich deeper experience than say over zoom which just kind of was it just it was it was the different while they were coming out of covid but man there's nothing like having an in-person session so it's 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 pretty awesome but one of the things too is like i think coaching we're still we're still trying to raise here locally right like our friends on the east and west coast i think it's more of a known accepted commodity like uh, in corporate settings and i think we're trying to catch up a little bit here but that's why it's so important for our chapter to kind of be the face of that and, and present what that can do for organizations moving forward mm, that's so important i think anybody who wants to level up and they start researching they start reading books they start going on youtube and they start looking at like how these people of who they want to emulate got there they you know obviously follow the path of others and lo and behold it what they didn't do it themselves have a circle of people that help them in different categories of their life right because there's only so much mm -hmm. you can do and at the end of the day you don't know what you don't know and having coaches like yourself or, and and coaches in other aspects of your life can help get you there and i would say uh the beauty of coaching is that they can uh, collapse time for you and maybe get you there a little bit quicker because oh, yeah. you've because you've done all this training you've done all this personal self growth to start seeing the patterns right and i think that's a big part mm -hmm. of being of success is pattern recognition for sure for sure and yeah to, to that time collapser i mean you know people kind of think like oh i've got my friends and i've got my family like they're good sounding boards and they're they're not not great sounding boards just they have a certain vision in a, in a certain way that fit you that if you're trying to expand and get out of that, they can't they can't meet you there. Right. And coaches can meet you exactly where you are and help get you to where you need to be. And um, maybe have some fun while you're doing it, too. Yeah. yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. 
Okay. So we're at 30, 30 minute mark. That was like cutoff time. I think we're going to wrap things up from here. Uh, oh, <laughs> last, 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 last parting question. Sure. What are you most looking forward to or excited about uh, going into? That's a, that's a tough question. There's a lot that I'm excited right now. I can't, I, I can't keep it just, I may have mentioned earlier, uh, maybe not, but, um, my wife and I are fairly new parents. Um, our son is 11 months old, and so he'll be celebrating his first birthday. His, his birthday is actually a day before mine in January. It's really cool. So getting to see him and his growth over the next year, I'm so excited for that. I'm really excited for what's next with that. In addition, outside of that, man, seeing where the chapter is going to go in 2024 and beyond is, is really exciting for me. We've got a lot of big things on the horizon, including a potential conference where we're bringing in other coaches. And there's there's just so much I can talk about with that. I won't I won't take up more of your time. And then in addition to that, just to watch my own growth and, and see where my business goes in the in the in the coming months, because this feels like I'm on the the precipice for a lot of some a lot of it a little chaotic, a little like building the plane while we're flying it. And now that we've kind of got some altitude and we've got some momentum, man, things are looking pretty awesome in 2024, um, including retreats and uh and and bigger and, and more impactful work over the years so i'm just like i said man i'm blessed i'm excited and i'm stoked and i'm, I'm ready for what's next what about you let me ask you what's the what's the biggest thing for you 2024 that you're looking for oh man so all this i've been build building a lot of momentum this past year I've it. everything i've, I've been it. doing with uh, you know my social media building just because i trying to build value and give value up front to people who are looking to, you know, cause I'm, I'm in real estate. Right. And, but I really want to focus on the, the voices that feel like home is unattainable because either they have student loan debt or they have bad credit. Right. I'm trying to partner up with the right people and come up with, and I have come up with it. I figured out an unconventional solution to the, to an unconventional problem that we have as for millennials, because I really, if I, I want to work with millennials all day, you know, that's my generation. I, I see the pain points that we're experiencing and, you know, I, I, I firmly believe you, if you solve the big problems, you know, the real estate stuff will figure itself out. Right. And the first big pain point is overcoming that student loan debt, showing them like, Hey, it, there are creative solutions and products there that can help you. And, uh, that's, and it's just education and just that awareness. And that is what I'm trying to do. And, uh, I've gotten better at doing that because anyone mm -hmm. who's ever trying to educate or do anything new. Yeah. Just try to inspire and, and, and spread, have awareness online. It's difficult, but yeah. I feel like I've gotten better and I've, I've seen, and that's the beauty of the video, especially is that you see the growth because you have like a, a history. Mm -hmm. uh of of your video that you can back and see so oh yeah i'm excited oh, yeah. because once once i help people because I, I see i see real estate as helping people if you help people then the real estate stuff is gonna it it, it doesn't it, it doesn't that's the by helping people first it becomes secondary right? yeah 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 and that's how I, I i've i've wanted to that lay the ground the groundwork in the foundation business it's so much more fun to think that way. It's so much more fulfilling yeah. to just try to, to be of service first. And the, the other shit will, will work itself out. The details will work themselves out. But look at it as you're trying to help solve a problem for people. And man, you can you can go far. Yeah. You said then it's then becomes very purpose driven and the desire to want to do it. I never it's not even a, a, a thought like it's never even like, oh, I have to do this. Look, I, I, I wake up excited because like, well, how am I going to be able to do it? And I was telling you earlier, I had another awesome kind of uh, call with the, a, a guy that I'm doing a credit repair series with. His name's Tamari Story. Great guy. And, you know, that just gives me energy. Yeah. And that's how I kind of see it. If stuff gives you energy, that means you're onto something and keep doing mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Do that stuff that fills your cup. It sounds like that. That's one of those things. So keep, keep doing that. Keep doing that. Hold that close. Be intentional about that, right? 100%. And I'm very big on intentions and, and, and having that being very contact with uh, the moves that I make. Um, let me ask you one last thing, because I feel for like our lines of work, um, we usually offer like to, if you, if you guys want to hold a Philip or see if it's a good, if you guys might be a good fit, 
you have, uh, I'm sure, like some type of consultation that's free mm -hmm. to see and, and, and talk about the process. Talk, speak on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So you can schedule time with me on my website, yallcoaching.com. You can reach out on Instagram at yallcoaching and uh, hit me in the DMs and have a, a conversation. But I always do free discovery sessions because not I tell people not every coach for every client. I think I think everyone can use a coach, but not like I said, there's sometimes there's a fit aspect, right? Like to work with millennials, et cetera. Sometimes such as certain fits are better than others. But it's always good to have that free discovery conversation where we kind of drill down on what the topic is. And I can kind of go over some of the jargon and, and explain a little bit about coaching and how we work together and form a little bit of a, a coaching agreement on how to how you'd like to be coached because everybody's different, right? Some people like a little bit more tough love. Some people are a little bit more on the sensitive side, whatever. Um, and then, yeah, can work together and try and solve a, solve at least one problem during that conversation and uh, and see where we can go there. But it's always good to have those conversations. And then I always say go for it anyway, because if even if I'm not the coach for you, man, I've got a network. I've got I, if I'm not the one, I, I can probably find somebody who will be more your speed. So and it's always good, man. I, I've walked away from a coaching session or discovery session and been like, oh, I hated that. Like, it's always so great just to meet people and there's such good energy. And yeah, I, I love it. So if you're interested, like I said, shoot me a DM or reach out on my website and you'll hear from me in no time. Mm. Yep, yeah, I'm the same way. If if we if we can't be a good fit, and that's okay, uh, I love being the connector for people, and oh, maybe yeah. I can at least point you in the right direction and be just the bridge to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. thanks for having, brother. We gotta we gotta set some time up. Get up to good lot soon. Oof, yes, that is calling our names. <laughs>